You are listening to Navigating the French on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content and a bonus episode of Navigating the French, please join us on Patreon. Hello, and welcome to Navigating the French, the podcast where each episode we take a look at a French word and try and see what it tells us about French culture. I'm your host, Emily Monaco. This week, I'm joined by Catherine English, a researcher and linguist at Université de Paris II, Panthéon, Assas. She's here to discuss a word whose meaning doesn't differ between French and English, even though its connotation does, and strikingly so. Individualisme. Welcome, Catherine, to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Emily. I'm happy to be here. For those of our listeners who aren't familiar with uh, your work, could you tell us a little bit about who you are and what your connection to France is? Okay. I'm American, born and raised in suburbs of Philadelphia. But after high school, I came to France just to learn French because my mother wanted me to. And I ended up passing my baccalauréat at the end. And then I went back to work in New York, which sounds like something inconsequential, but I didn't like it. And so I traveled and I went to Poland, Sweden, England, worked around the world a little bit. And when I was 21, 22, I said, gosh, I got to go to school. And in France, it was free. I had a baccalaureate so I could get in. So I figured I'd do um, a degree at the Sorbonne and I did. And I just never left. So that was 40 some years ago. So that's my connection with France. I just ended up here and I really, I guess I like it. (laughs) I'll put it that way. But I also have a passion for language because not just the words, I know you like words, but a word has a meaning, but behind a word, there's, there's a value. Okay. Words have connotations. Words are triggers that we pull and these triggers can trigger people. And there are a lot of them, words that seem to mean more or less the same thing in French and English, but they don't have the same cultural value. Okay, a very simple one is to say bread. Okay, In France, it's a baguette. It's made six times a day. You're never ashamed to say your children are boulanger because you know they're doing something useful. Bread in the US, I just don't think it has the same meaning. And I think you buy it in plastic and it's already sliced. So it's, you know, so we're talking about something that's different. So we're going to talk today about this word individualism, which apparently is causing problems and the problems that it's causing are very uh, good ones. My interaction with this word really only started, I'll say in about 1998, when I joined the Cultura project that is hosted at MIT and authored by uh, Gilbert Furstenberg. And In this project, a group of students at MIT who were Americans and a group of students in France who were at my French uh, Grande École at that time, uh, we had them work on the same project. It was hosted at MIT, and we started with a list of words. And I'm going to ask you to actually do this at the same time as I say it. With this list of words we had were France, USA, capitalism, individualism, society, socialism, just, you know, we had about 20 words and the students had about 10 minutes to come up with three to five words. The first things that come to mind, don't think about it. So if you just take the word individualism, what are the first three words that come to mind? I'll ask you to maybe note them down. All right. Now then at MIT, the computer program would anonymously put the French words on one side and the English words on the other side. The Americans are writing in English, the French are writing in French. Well, lo and behold, we have the most astonishing. I was astonished. And I had already been living in France. I already had my degrees. I already had my PhD. I mean, I, you know, it was, I knew France, right? But I didn't. In 1998, okay, the American students came up, what they associated with individualism was freedom of expression, originality, independence, confidence, free, open-minded, selfish, Independence identity, Republican pot smokers, unique, college mind, independence personality. Basically, 92% of the words were connotated positively. On the French side, we had individualisme, inégalité, classe préparatoire, isolement, Occident, égoïsme, États-Unis, libéralisme, Friedman, 
moi, seul, inefficace, États-Unis, Français parisien, ambition, égoïsme, méchanceté, égo économique, société moderne, solitude, égocentrisme. That comes up many times. Anyway, basically 90% were negative. So individualism was associated with the U.S. Later on, it's associated with capitalism. It's associated with things that we kind of going to push away. For the people living in the provinces, they associate it with Parisians. For people that, you know, maybe did not do the Grande École or even did them, they associate it with the class préparatoire, where it's each for their own. So here we had a word that looks, you know, it's a cognate. It looks like the same word. Dictionary definitions did not give strikingly different definitions. It's slightly different, but nothing, nothing striking. And I thought, wow, Americans idealized individualism and focus on individual success, individual values, individual property, uh, defense of individual property. It's a big deal in the U.S. And in France, well, it was an embarrassment to be an individualist or to be individualista is to ignore the collective to the benefit of the individual. It's to put your own desire for, I don't know, fame, wealth, friendship, romance, above the value of the society, of the collective society. And this has a lot of spin-offs. By the way, can I just take a break and see what your words were? Absolutely. I, it was very interesting to listen to you listing them because I wrote down independent, solitary, and selfish. So you're beautifully contradictory. Well, that and I will say, I have I mean, I grew up in the United States, but I've been living in France for 15 years. And I think that my attitude towards individualism has definitely evolved in my time here. So so I think, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty much an even split there, as much of an even split as you can be with three words. Okay. Well, living in two countries, you're going to be in two cultures. I guess, I mean, France is not just a country. There's a lot of France outside of France. Um, I think it's a way of being, a way of thinking, a way of deciding how you live your life and the values that you put on certain things above other things. And I'm going to probably agree with you on your choice of words because I myself also live these internal contradictions. The American side of me thinks one thing. And the French side of me thinks something else. And how you resolve these contradictions is, well, that's the challenge of what it is to be alive and to live and to interact with people. So what we had our students do is we had forums. Now, this is back in 1998, right? We didn't have Web 2 yet, no social media, but we had chats and we called them forums. And uh, this was just starting up and, you know, the MIT people, they were surprised because they had chats for math and physics and all kinds of science and they'd get 10 messages a week. And then this language department had this, this culture or project and we'd get 200 messages a week and they're saying, how can they get people so interested in talking to each other? Well, these American students would look at the data. The French students would look at the data and they had to try to explain it. And so the French would say what it meant, you know, individualism and not respecting society, like putting the importance of belonging to society on a higher level than the importance of self-realization, self-actualization. I don't know if that's, if that makes sense. Whereas for the Americans, some of the Americans said, well, I'm insulted. How could the French trash a value that we hold so dear. It's not, we don't know who is putting in which words. You know, the forums were nominative, but, but the data is, comes across anonymous. So we don't know who put which words in. So no one was trying to trash anybody. Okay. But what they were simply talking about is words and values. And that's why meanings of words are the tip of the iceberg. In almost any conversation with anyone, we know what the word means, but what does it mean to that person? And what does it trigger within that person? So we have to look more deeply at these words. And individualism by itself, well, it's just a word. What does it mean if you put it with authority? Uh, another one of our words was police. So the first questionnaires was this, this set of words. And, it, you know, it's interesting. But the second set of questionnaires was complete a sentence. 
a good boss is someone who, a good friend is someone who, and the third set of questionnaires are hypothetical situations, such as you see a mother slap her child in the supermarket, what do you do? Or it's midnight, you're home alone, someone knocks at your door, what do you do? And the third, you see a student, a classmate, cheating on an exam, what do you do? So the students then have to come up with answers to this. Now, this is where individualism is interesting, because looking at the forums, the discussions, that's very interesting. Some Americans would say, I believe in individualism. Uh, that's why I have a piercing and tattoos and I wear baggy jeans. I'm expressing my individualism. Well, the French would interpret that your piercings in your baggy jeans are to look like someone who belongs to a certain tribe or a certain caste. It's the opposite of individualism. It's not striking out your own path. It's following a fashion. So it can go back and forth to what does it really mean to be an individualism, an individualist? You know, the words have the same meaning, but they have just about an antonymic correspondence. I would like us to jump to the instance of cheating on an exam. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Now, the French side, the French will say, I smile at him. I turn my paper so he can see. I help him. You know, the people that cheat on the exams are the ones who aren't very good to start with. So come on, let's give them a hand. Mm -hmm. Because the idea of authority, authority is something you want to work around. You see authority, which here was incarnated by the teacher, and it represents an obstacle. Let's get around it. For the Americans, they were offended by the French responses. <laughs> and they said, well, in my university, we have an honor code that if we see anyone cheating, we have to report them. So most American students would not say anything, but they would glare at the student and move their paper so that the student, the cheater could not see it. Okay. Most of them just kind of avoided it that way, but some of them reported the cheater because that was part of this honor code. Well, then the French got really annoyed. I mean, they took annoyed in the French, you know, embêté, énervé, because they said that's what the collaborators did during World War II. C'est de la délation. You know, we don't denounce our fellow classmates. So there was the point of honor in France for my French students was almost systematically not to report the cheater and actually to help the cheater get by because the cheater needed help. And the Americans saw it totally differently. I don't know if that answers the question to say, are, are they different? Well, I think they're very different. Individualism is positive in the U.S. because that is what gives people initiative. I think they look for jobs where they can create things and carry out projects. Whereas in France, the individualist is the person who does not want to contribute to the Sécurité Sociale, that does not want to pay. Well, French people don't like to pay their taxes because t the tax people represent the authorities and they like to skirt around authority and they're proud when they can do it. So like I see, we don't have a blanket rule that would be that simple for, you know, everybody. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Don't Miss This, which will clue you into some of the most interesting events happening in Paris right now. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now back to Navigating the French. You did highlight in one of the situations that you described something that I've noticed a lot that I'd love to kind of delve a little bit deeper into, which is when you said, uh, what do you do if you see a, a mother with a child misbehaving in a supermarket? Was that? Exactly. Yeah. And get slapped by the mother. Yeah. And I think that it's very interesting to see the ways in which French people very unabashedly will scold or otherwise parent strangers' children in public or sort of ally themselves with, I mean, I, I remember I, just a week ago, I was getting off a train in the South of France and the conductor saw a sort of gaggle of maybe 12 or 13 year olds trying to get on the train. And he scolded them and said, let everybody off the train first. And I feel as though in the United States, you know, if you were to parent someone else's child or scold someone else's child, there would be repercussions for you. Huh. Yeah. I, well, I think it could happen in France too. If your child is misbehaving and the parents aren't doing anything and another parent steps in, 
I think it really, you've got to be careful. I think you really have to be careful. But what had really changed? I mean, I mean, I started this project in 1998 and I stopped in 2007. Uh, simply because I went on to do another project with Taiwan. But the program continued until 2020. So I, I looked up some of the results in 2020 and the French should, you know, they would tell the person not to slap their child because of child abuse. They would consider it child abuse. But the idea, sometimes French parents will go out of their way to scold their children in public to show the other people that they're raising their child properly. And when they're at home, they let them get away with everything. And it's kind of Americans are a little bit the opposite. I mean, not exactly the opposite, but I think American children have more creative freedom than French ones do. I mean, I see French kids sit at a dinner table, a lunch table for two hours on Sundays and eat their meals and wait, help the parents, you know, clear off the dishes. But they'll spend those two hours sitting down and having lunch because it's Sunday. Whereas I don't see American kids sit down for lunch or not very long maybe 15 minutes. My own children were born and raised in France and they went to French schools. But I would I would take them back to the States and they'd have day camp. So I would make them brown bag lunches. And they, when I went to pick them up, they hadn't eaten their lunch. And I said, why didn't you eat it? Didn't you like it? And they said, no, mom, we didn't have time. I mean, these people, they just sit down on the stairs and they, they gobbled their meal. We were waiting for a table and a chair. <laughs> so, I mean, I think there are differences... I mean, there's, if we talk about food, we know there's a, enormous differences. But in terms of behavior and what is considered good behavior and not good behavior, it's a vast subject. I mean, individualism, for the nine years that I worked on the program, I really had between 90 and 92% positive for the U.S., negative for France, except for the semester after 9-11, where it was not 90% positive, but maybe 80% positive. Okay. It dipped a little bit. Um, but after that, uh, I think, I think individualism is a true value for Americans. I think we have to honor it, cherish it, nurture it, respect it. At the same time, we live in France. Okay. And so when I've been, you know, I've had various jobs and I'm, I hope to retire next year, but I'm still working at the university. But whenever I, I, I get into discussions with my colleagues and, you know, this or that, they say, oh, oui, oui, mais vous êtes atypique. I'm perpetually atypique because the fallout of that individualism is that you're not going to fit into these perfect triangles and squares that the French education system puts you into. You know, if you want to be an English teacher, you do a licence d'anglais, you do your agrégation d'anglais, you do your thesis in anglais, and then you do the concours. And no, that's not what I did. You know, I mean, I sure I did. I did a bunch of degrees, but I didn't do an agrégation, and I don't see, I don't see my role in the French university as just teaching irregular verbs. I see it's more important that I uh, teach things like cultura. You know, when you're dealing in intercultural and cross-cultural situations, we don't really know the impact of the words that we have. We, we can suspect them, but, you know, unless we really know the historical context, the cultural context, we don't know how our words and our actions uh, will be interpreted. I'm curious. So France does have this motto that's kind of incarnated as part of the Republic of liberty, equality, fraternity, liberté, égalité, fraternité. And I, my research focused very deeply on sort of the differences between liberté and égalité and the ways in which, you know, those values are incarnated differently in America and in France. But when we're talking about individualism, I feel like the fraternity side comes into closer focus and becomes very important. And, and I'm wondering, you know, what for you is the relationship between the French perception of individualism and this value of fraternité. Is there an, a relationship there? I would use not so much fraternité, I'd say solidarité. But I, I'll take fraternité in that sense. And I, I always was also interested in liberté, égalité, fraternité, especially that the U.S., when it was uh, adopting its mottos for, um, I can't remember exactly what it was, I think it was Benjamin Franklin, or maybe someone like Jefferson saying that they wanted to include fraternity 
but they felt that their republic was so young that it would be too difficult to ask the farmers and the kind of people that were you know, running the revolution to undertake that notion of fraternité. And I, once again, I think we have to think that liberté, égalité, and fraternité devant la loi, we have to remember that it doesn't mean in all life, but before the law, where on est égal devant la loi, that's the part of equality. I might just say with something Macron said, not a, I'm not a super fan of Macron, but he does have some nice sound bites. And one of them is that the liberté is more for people leaning to the right because they want freedom of expression, freedom to travel, freedom to do what they want. Egalité seems a lot more important to people from the left because they want equal chances for people. They want to share the burden and share the tax load. And fraternité comes in there to make the two agree, that it's a dimension and a concept to hope that the people in you know who value liberty over equality will have a little bit of empathy, and those who value equality over liberty, liberty will have a little bit, bit more tolerance. You know, I, I don't know if exactly if that's how it works, but the fraternité, which I think we can associate with solidarité, which we put in our word list in 1998, 1999, and took it out in around 2000, because it wasn't a really good talking point. For the Americans, when I gave them solidarité, they, some people said in, at MIT, they said evil, Oh. Or what's that? And other people said uh, a Polish trade union. That was. Wow. Sorry, down Okay. So solidarity just didn't. Some people would associate it with socialism, but socialism was associated with evil. I think I put socialism in. Th this is a project that we make up. You know, we set out the 20 some year words every year. I, I would talk with my colleague at MIT and we'd, we'd go back and forth and we say, well, let's use this word. Because uh, Madame uh, Furstenberg, Gilbert, she was a French journalist from, I think she worked for the Express or Le Point. And then she went to Boston, fell in love with an American, got married and stayed. And so being in the U.S., she became a French teacher. So she was a French person teaching French in the U.S., and I was an American person teaching English in France. So we're, we were like mirrored opposites. And so when we would negotiate our word list, you know, I said, oh, well, this is, this is a word that's bugging me. Because these words, for people who are living across cultures, it doesn't just have to be, you know, America and France. It could be England and France. It can be a very good word. It's Germany and France. And they're even neighbors. But the difference in the values of words of concepts behind these words, they're striking. It makes Europe an interesting place to be. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it also makes a lot of the English that comes out of Europe complicated because we have a French translator writing in English using abstract German concepts and, and then wanting to get into the deep. I mean, it, it, it's complicated. Anyway, so if we have the notion of the values of liberté and égalité, are these contradictory values? I'm getting back to Macron's idea. Do we not use the idea of fraternity? So, I mean, to, you know, melt them, help them merge together. Because you can't underestimate when you're working in France, the deep value that equality has. And I've, I've been on numerous juries for uh, entrance exams to the Grande École, where candidates come in and everyone wants to get in. Well, when you're the examiner, you know, you, you listen and, okay, okay, I do my job. I, What's their English like? Okay, I give them a level. But they're very, very demanding that every student get exactly the same amount of time, that every student get exactly the same information. Because being faced with this race to get into a grande école, the notion of being equal, at least before the exam, is very, very important. I'm just curious if you have a sense that there's, it's like you said, there's this almost exacting, demanding dogmatic desire for perfect equality in as much as we can achieve it. And I remember Alexis de Tocqueville commenting that, you know, the French would rather be equal in chains than than free but unequal. So it's very an intense, this desire for equality here. Do you feel as though that contributes to the negative connotations that the French have of individualism? Or is that linked to something else entirely? Um, no, I think you're, I th for me, in an abstract theoretical perspective, I think you're exactly right. And I might give you a mental picture. Uh, in the Middle Ages, when the farm laborers would have scythes and they would cut the wheat, uh, they would do it in a line. Sometimes they would sing 
and they would have the same movement, everyone working together, because collectively they drew more strength than they would individually. But the individualist would be someone who would get to maybe to the end of the line and want to work faster. And by working faster, perhaps the, you know, the, the Lord or the master would appreciate it, but he would be breaking the line. And that, I don't know if you can have that image in your mind Mm -hmm. of farm laborers all working at the same rhythm. I think when you have everyone marching to the same step and someone breaks the line, he's detrimental to everyone if they're trying to hold the line. And then at the same time, there are those that never break the line. And by never breaking the line, the other side of this notion of equality can become a a kind of inertia because the French will be always marching to the same step, but they don't dare experiment. I mean, th- this Cultura program, which was a fabulous program, it was, I, I think in 2001, it was voted one of the top 10 best internet-based learning programs by the National Endowment for the Humanities, which had financed it. But in that, the time the financing came around, they withdrew their financing because of what, Fra- uh, what de Villepin said at the UN about weapons of mass destruction not existing. And therefore, they didn't want to finance a program with a foreign country, especially if that country was France. So so we suddenly had to find more money to keep it going. But I mean, it went on going. But the notion of equality, I've given you one vision of it, but there's another vision, and that's the equality that we don't want to see. If you look at the French education system, okay, all of the students are going to go and it will be the same program, and they're more or less the same number of hours and teachers. And technically, it's all the same, but there's such difference between good schools and not good schools. What do we consider a good school, in fact? And looking at it from the position of Education Nationale, everyone has to march to the same drummer. And there's now there are more options. Uh, You can now take music, you can take sports, you can do theater, you can do cinema, you can have much more varied baccalaureate, but the basic core is solid. The core culture is very solid. And technically it's the same for all, but it most certainly isn't. Because if you look at the number of students who get into the Grande École, you know, they're white, they're male, they're coming from educated backgrounds, educated or wealthy backgrounds. Um, And I will distinguish between education and wealth because there are those that are very wealthy and can pay for the best training for their kids. And if their kids are motivated, they'll get there. And if they have the means, but if you don't have a lot of money, but you're a, you know, a teacher or you're from the academic background, the kids also get there. But if you're not from either wealthy or an educated background, you're not going to see the kid in a Grande Cote. I mean, in the very good, I mean, I'm talking about the very good Grande Cote. There are very few those who are of Arabic background, you don't see that many. Um, those that are come from the fr- former French colonies in West Africa, you don't see that many. So when we talk about égalité, we've got a glaring, glaring contradiction. Absolutely. Yeah. And then also the state does not take statistics on this. When you look at uh, the American uh, Affirmative action things from what was, I think that still exists from the 60s and 70s. At least America strives for a more perfect union. I think for the whole thing, the fraternity, I think we would use the word union. Okay, we'd, we would try to be a United States. We would we'd try to have the notion of union, whereas in French, they will use the word fraternity. But of course, fraternity will be translated by brotherhood or fraternity, right? It won't be translated by union, and union would be by union or syndicat. Words do not exist in isolation. They exist as clusters. And they're not free-floating. They're linked via sort of semantic conceptual networks. So when we have to say, oh, well, this word associates with this, what I'm saying is kind of abstract, but it can make more sense if you think of it as a word being a nodule, a part of a link in a network. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, The Heart of You, where expert Annette talks manifesting, tarot, and so much more. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Navigating the French. And I think we can take this word of individualism as being the hinge between authority and the individual. And does that, how far does that hinge open? 
you know, I mean, the whole notion of authority for the French, it's what you have to work around. Uh, I have a feeling there's a little bit more respect. There's a different kind of respect for Americans. See, I haven't lived in the States for a long time. So I, I'd be a bit cautious about talking about authority. Uh, authority versus versus authoritarian. I, th- I think it, it's very important to distinguish, um, obviously, between the two words, but in that the words sound a little bit alike. It can be very uh, tricky. And one of the best courses I had was when I was studying in Poland and a philosophy professor went through for Polish. This is when there was an Iron Curtain and the Soviet Union. So what teachers could teach was monitored and they had to be careful. But the, the, the teacher still drew a board and said, what is authority? Well, this is someone who knows, someone who has experience, uh, someone who has tried a lot of experiments and has come up with conclusions. What's authoritarian? It's someone who wants to force his ideas, say that his ideas are correct, and get everyone to follow them. And I think it was pretty risky to, to, to make that kind of distinction in, in the world at that time. The one thing about the, the French people not the flagrant inequalities in France that we see and we experience, they don't give us statistics because that is forbidden. Of course, the Ministry of the Interior has statistics on these things, but they don't publish them and they don't release them because that would mean a, a citoyen is a citoyen. And this, the, the distinction to be had in France is the citoyen versus a non-citoyen. I don't know, did you take French nationality or not? I did. I, I have French nationality, but I mean, it is a, it is definitely a, a distinction that I I notice in terms of. I feel as though I'm. I know that I'm French. I have my ID card and everything, and technically, I am a citizen. There is a bit of a cultural gap that I don't know that I ever get to uh, completely bridge as a foreign-born, naturalized French person. But I am a citizen. Exactly. I think bridge is the wonderful world, but I think you're living on with two, there are two people inside of you. Mm-hmm. And these two people, you know, they're, they're both valid people. In Poland, they made a big distinction between citizenship and nationality because citizenship is your passport. Uh, that can be taken away from you. But your nationality, it's your language, it's your culture, it's what you eat. Uh, it's the way you cook. It's the stories people have told you. And no one can take that away from you. So even though you transfer to a different country and may love France and, you know, I adore things in France, I, would say, I cherish it. I, I've been given wonderful opportunities here, like a free university education. There's wonderful opportunities and, you know, I love it, but I still have these gut reactions, which are my American nationality with my French citizenship. Yes, I have French papers. I, you know, I have a French passport, but I'm, I'm also very grateful for the possibility of having them both. And I hope that I will always be able to keep them both. Same here. <laughs> yeah. It's like really an important thing for me. Now, is that, is that individualization? You had once mentioned the article by Pierre Bréchon. Yes. And saying that individualism is declining in France while individualization is increasing. And there are two words that look alike, but they're not. Individualization is adapting to the person. It could be adapting your, your sexual orientations. It could be adapting to various, you know, gender types or different, you know, mixture of races, or it could be adapting learning styles. Like the French system is not very good at adapting to learning styles. Education nationale teaches to one. So if you if you have a child with a learning difficulty, you, you really want to find some other option. When things are individuated to people's, you know, to their needs or to their identities, that therefore that would decrease their individualism. And individualism is putting your personal desires, your personal needs ahead of the collective, your responsibility to the collective group. Those are the two differences. Now, it's funny because we were doing our research at the same time, but I was always working in language and teaching languages using the internet. So that I was in my little bubble and he's in another bubble. So I, I didn't run across his work. You know, I would have challenged the way uh, he wrote his article in English, but using the French interpretation of individualism. Of course, he's writing in English, but the cultural values behind it are not the same. You know, that will trigger for me. Oh, well, this has to be. That's what academics do is they criticize each other. <laughs> okay, but no, but yes, his article is really great because towards the end of it, in a small part, he said, yes, individuation 
has shown a reduction of individualism. In the cases where there was enough money or family support to individualize, you know, training, life, living perceptions, sexual orientation, or, you know, eating habits, when there was enough money and comfort to, to support individualization, it did lead to a decline in individualism. But in the families or the French elements of society, where there was not enough money, nor enough education, nor the, the comfort to support an individual parcours for these people, individualism is still very strong. He um, actually showed, mentioned the Gilets jaunes movement as how that was striking out and, and as a difference. I think the question of individualism, individualization, and looking to the values behind it and the struggle behind it will tell us a lot about French society. But I don't have any uh, perfect answers. Sure. So do you get the sense then that today there's an evolution or a movement in terms of how the French are interpreting and connoting this? I mean, from the beginning of when you were doing this research in the 90s to now, mm. is the connotation of individualisme in France evolving and changing? Okay, so I'm going to agree with Pierre Bréchon, who actually did the work. <laughs> you know, he's, he's a political scientist in sociology, so he's using different measurements. I'm not sure that I always believe the way the sociologists use words. I'm a little bit picky because I'm a linguist. But that's all they've got to work with. So I will agree with his conclusion that the French people that have been able, that have had the comfort in their lives to take advantage of the Erasmus programs, to travel abroad, um, who come from families that are open and traveling and globalizing. And yeah, I think individualism has declined among people who are 20 or 30 years old now and have had these opportunities. I think they're very, they're acutely aware of globalized societies that are different and the world that we're living in, it's different. But among the French people, at least those that I know, and I don't know all 60 million of them, mm -hmm. those that come from a background that people have never taken an airplane. A lot of people have never ridden in an airplane. There are a lot of them, okay? Uh, people who have been maybe to Paris only once, or people who, closer to my age, when they went abroad, it was for their service militaire. Those people, they're how can I say, they're, they're with the workers who are cutting down the wheat. They're walking in step. And for them, there are individualistic aspects in their character and a dislike of individualism. But within them, they will have individualistic features that they don't like within themselves. But it's kind of a way of self-protection, self for self-survival, self, uh, yeah, they're protecting their self. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense to anyone except me. No, it makes absolute sense. And I think it's such an interesting illustration of the way, I mean, there's conflict, obviously, in, in all of us, but I think there's something, I think that to say hypocritical would be to push it too far, but there are a lot of inner conflicts in, in the French character. And, and this is obviously overgeneralizing, and that's part of the, the fun balance of this podcast, but but there is an interesting conflict between these questions of authority and individualism and being an individual as part of a collective, as part of a society in France and, and among the French that I find so fascinating. So thank you so much for, for sharing your insight, for sharing your research, and for sharing your expertise. It has been so wonderful to have you on the podcast. Before I let you go, is there anywhere that folks can find you online, on social media, read more about your work? Where can we find you? Well, my, my work is all published in academic journals that no one reads. And that's probably for the best. It's probably just as well that way. I'm kind of a hermit. So I don't have a website. I have a Facebook page for my students, but I don't open it up to anyone else. But uh, if you're interested in more words, you can always go to the archives at at uh, it's https cultura c u l t u r a dot m i t dot e d u, and if you go to past uh, programs, uh, there you've got all of the data since 1998. You know you can see the words that we've chosen, 
And we will drop a link to that archive in the show notes so that anybody who wants to check that out can feel free to click over and see how individualism, but also all of these other fascinating words connoted to different groups of students. So thank you so much, Catherine, for joining me. Um, have a fantastic rest of your day. Okay. You <laughs> and too. hope to have you back to discuss other words in the future. Thank you very much. This has been Navigating the French. You can find more from me, Emily Monaco, at Emily underscore in underscore France on Twitter and Instagram. This podcast is produced by Paris Underground Radio. To listen to other episodes of this podcast or to discover more podcasts like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and à bientôt. This episode of Navigating the French was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more great content, join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio.